Look at that. It's the end of. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it. As you can probably tell by my previous videos, I'm a bit of a game connoisseur. I've played hundreds of games in my time, and I get pretty into a lot of them. But what you may not know is that I also have a vested interest in lost media. I find it a fascinating topic, and while I don't personally contribute to the search, I consume a healthy amount of content in regards to lost film, television, games, and music. And naturally, this interest also leads to an interest in the intentionally lost, scrapped content that never made it to release. Scrapped gaming content is even more fascinating, and oftentimes frustrating, to see what kind of interesting material could have made it, and today I thought I'd go over some of my favorite games and examine some of their cut content and what I would expect it to look like had it ever seen the light of day. So let's dive right in with some Marvel, baby! I'm here to tell you about Marvel vs. Capcom! Me. Look, I'm gonna be straight with you. This game has lots of girls. You like girls? I do. Oh, man. Naturally, the most exciting part of any fighting game's cut content library is the scrapped characters. When deciding the roster of Marvel vs. Capcom's third installment, we know that the dev team had an absolutely massive list to choose from, and from that list, we know of about 50 characters who didn't make the cut, as well as which ones were close to actually making it in. I won't go over every last character, but I will go over the most interesting tidbits to me. I'll leave a link in the description to a reddit thread outlining every cut character we know. First up is Silver Surfer, who is definitely an iconic character and would have fit in greatly with the game's story. The cited reason for his exclusion was that he was unable to fight with his board, and without the board he looks like Iceman, which shouldn't matter since Iceman also didn't make it in and is not even on the list of characters we know. But in my opinion, the bigger issue isn't visual similarities, it's the fact that the surfer just isn't himself if he's not using the board to fight. So if they couldn't get it to work, it's best that he got passed over. What could he realistically do without the board? Reasonably, he could create illusions, teleport, and he could manipulate matter so he could have some projectiles, but all in all, without the most iconic part of his kit, I really do think this was a reasonable cut. Also hailing from the Fantastic Four comics was Human Torch, who was actually functional to an extent in the game, but the fire visual effects caused strain on the game's memory. This was combined with the fact that Marvel would ultimately give an ultimatum of either all of the Fantastic Four or none of them. They would eventually go on to recommend Super Scroll to the team to represent those power sets, and that's who wound up on the roster. Personally speaking, I've never been too keen on the Fantastic Four, and a lot of what he can do is covered by other characters, so while he's a notable omission, I don't really lose any sleep over the fact he wasn't finished, though I do have a theory on what he could have played like. I'm willing to bet he plays a lot like Nova would go on to play in Ultimate, with a lot of air dashing, plus being able to shoot fire-based projectiles as well as set up traps on the stage. Nova's hyper combos even look like things that Johnny could reasonably do with his powers, so I bet a lot of his moveset got transferred over and he lives on in spirit. Next up, a pair of Spider-Man characters, Dr. Octopus and Miles Morales. Doc Ock was one of the closest to completion, with even his character theme being confirmed to be complete. However, the earliest build we have access to no longer contains most of his data, just a selection screen icon. He was cut and stopped being worked on due to a number of glitches regarding his tentacles. It's possible he would have been included via the Ultimate Update had the 2011 Tohoku Earthquake not impacted development. More on that later. Miles was a character both Marvel and Capcom were interested in including, but he had just premiered in the comics recently, so there wasn't enough time to work on him. My thoughts on these two? Well, as a big Spider-Man nerd, I think both would have made awesome picks, and Doc Ock is one of my most wanted characters should the series ever return. I imagine his range would be absolutely insane, and he'd have a pretty substantial grappler playstyle. He might actually even have a chance at dethroning Manon for bullshit grab ranges. And now, I kinda want these two to appear in a future game together, just so I can screw over Manon players like they screw me over in Street Fighter VI. Miles would likely share a lot of DNA with Peter for his kit, but have some differences of his own, like X-23 ended up sharing a lot of Wolverine's traits, though incorporating his Venom abilities into his kit as well. That said, I think it's alright Miles sat MVC3 out, provided he shows up in a future game. 
if such a thing ever comes to pass. I'm not holding my breath, but I suppose stranger things have happened. There's not much known about Blade, other than that he was cut for being too similar to Dante, but I think that's a load of crock myself. Yeah, like, both use swords and guns, but Blade is a vampire, and lots of Dante's moveset utilizes other devil arms, and, well, Deadpool's here too. They cited that an overabundance of characters with guns was an issue, but I personally think they should have gone Blade rather than, say, Modoc, X-23, or Shuma Garath. Plus, Blade could have had some cool interactions with the cast of Darkstalkers. Yeah, his moveset would have been a little more basic, but Blade's such a cool character that I think that could carry him into being a fan favorite alone. On top of that, only 7 of the 50 characters on the roster prominently use swords in their movesets, so I definitely feel this was a bit of a missed opportunity. Cloak and Dagger were an idea that was really liked by the team, as they would have functioned like a stand user from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Cloak would hover above Dagger during gameplay. Considering the stellar JoJo arcade fighter Capcom had made in the past, a callback to that would have been genuinely awesome. Apparently they were cut for Cloak's appearance being indistinguishable from assists, but other characters summon allies as well as part of their kit, like Felicia, so I think this is a flimsy justification. Cloak probably would have manipulated darkness, and been able to set up trap fields that could cause chip damage to fighters as well as teleport around the field for attacks, while Dagger would have likely conjured daggers to use as melee or projectiles. They likely would have been sort of a keep-away character together. Squirrel Girl was another name proposed and got cut for possibly the funniest reason. There were more people on the dev team that liked raccoons than squirrels, so Rocket was chosen in her place. Presumably her moveset would have involved summoning squirrels to fight, which if you ask me, would have made her an excellent joke character, something the Marvel side doesn't really have, unless you think, I don't know, Modoc is one. The other most substantial cut was Luke Cage, aka Power Man. In total, there were an additional 8 characters planned for Ultimate. We don't know all of them, but Luke was one of the more complete characters. I imagine he was probably picked due to being a relevant character in the comics at the time, as he was one of Cap's earliest allies during the Civil War comic run. Personally, Luke's power set doesn't feel super distinct to me. He would be doing a lot of what She-Hulk and Hulk already covered, though maybe he could use his chain belt as a smaller range version of some of Ghost Rider's moves. I can't say Luke is exactly one I'm begging for to show up in a future title, though. But that's just the Marvel side. Capcom's got some equally crazy picks that wound up on the cutting room floor. Gil, from Street Fighter 3, was cut extremely late in development. Reportedly, he had a number of working moves, and his model was finished, but he was both massive and fast, which made him feel weird in Marvel 3's speed. Ultimately, he was replaced by Nemesis, who was just as big, but slower, which they felt was more appropriate. I get the intent, but Gil's a pretty unique character, and I would have loved to see how he would have played, though it's not hard to imagine what it would have looked like, being that he's a final boss from a fighting game. John Talbane, the werewolf from Darkstalkers, was one of the next characters in line, and in roughly the same position as Luke Cage, being one of the eight characters intended for the ultimate update. I don't personally have a huge attachment to John Talbane or even Darkstalkers as a whole, but I know he's one of the series' more beloved characters, so I think he would have been an excellent choice. He could have had some fun interactions with Amaterasu and some of the more supernatural Marvel cast, especially characters like Blade or Cloak and Dagger if they would have gotten in as well. Like Gil, it's pretty easy to envision Talbane's kit, since he too is from a fighting game. Dmitri Maximoff, also hailing from Darkstalkers, was cut for a very funny reason. His iconic attack Midnight Bliss, which transforms enemy characters into females, each representing a different... Uh, preference. Not only would this likely get shut down by Marvel for their cast, but it would also take an extremely long time to develop even if they did get approval. Ultimately, I think Dimitri is better off staying out of it, as not only would it have aged pretty poorly, but that's kind of the most interesting part of his kit. He's sort of the beginner character for Darkstalkers, in my understanding. So, I'm okay with him getting axed. Three different characters from the Breath of Fire series of RPGs were considered, but all got axed for the same reason. The series was not popular in the West, where most of MVC's popularity comes from. 
Fulu was the fan favorite, with an energy sword, the ability to summon monster companions, and to shapeshift into a dragon all being cited as potential moves, but he was deemed too difficult to implement due to the latter. Cat, the one I would most like to see personally, was desired because they wanted a female staff user, but of the three she ended up being the lowest of priority. I imagine she probably would have played a little like Son Son from MVC2, who was also considered for the same reason as Cat. Nina actually made it pretty close to release, but was one of the last cuts made. She's a recurring character in the same vein that there's always a Link and a Zelda in Legend of Zelda. Her design was based on the original game, but her level 3 would have involved her summoning the other Ninas from the other games, similar to Mega Man's Final Smash in Smash Bros. I think Nina would have been the most interesting from a gameplay design. I love aerial focused characters in these kind of games, and she definitely would have been pretty solid off the ground. I don't think lack of familiarity should ever be a reason to not include a character. You can't just have everyone be the most iconic characters. You gotta have a few curveballs to keep it interesting. So Nina's probably the cut character I'd like to see the most. Franziska von Karma from Ace Attorney gives her a run for her money though. She got cut from Tatsunoko vs. Capcom alongside Phoenix Wright, so I feel bad that she got the axe twice. She'd probably also utilize objections and possibly even a stance system, but unlike Phoenix, she always has a weapon on her, a whip for those who haven't played Justice for All, and she uses it a lot. And I mean a lot. Her moveset probably wouldn't be overtly complex, but I do like the character a lot and it would be really funny to see, so I'm sad she didn't end up joining. Tessa, from the fighting game that's also an RPG, Red Earth, was one that the game's producer, Ryota Nitsuma, really wanted to rival Doctor Strange, being a more traditional witch, but he couldn't convince his team that she was a worthy inclusion. I think this was a huge missed opportunity, as I'm always a fan of Capcom referencing their weird experimental stuff. Yeah, like Strange, she'd probably be a huge zoner and a pain in the ass to fight, but part of the reason I love MVC3 is due to all the fun interactions between characters on both sides. There were a lot of other characters that were considered, but these are, in my opinion, the most interesting picks. If we could go back and add the 8 extra characters, assuming John and Luke were next up, I think I'd like to see Squirrel Girl, Franziska, Doc Ock, Gil, Cloak and Dagger, and either one of the considered Breath of Fire characters or Tessa to take that last slot. Given the time, it's crazy to see that despite being in 3D now, they wanted a roster bigger in number to MVC2. For now though, I think we'll just have to settle on seeing the cast of Marvel 3 expand through fan mods, because that community has some awesome stuff on display, including some of these characters, like Talbane and Blade currently in the works, amongst other cool picks. Can, can someone make jury please? Sonic! Crossover fighters are cool and all, but they aren't the only kinds of crossover games out there. A personal favorite crossover for me has got to be the original Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing. The sequel improved on the track design exponentially, but in doing so it made the roster so much more bland, cutting so many of my favorite characters from the first in exchange for double dipping on some series and an overabundance of guest characters. They even dropped the Sega from the title. So while I definitely prefer the sequel on the gameplay front, I can't help but still love the OG and continue to boot it up from time to time, between the wackier roster and the more interesting all-star moves. But there are a decent handful of cut characters from the OG that I think are absolutely worth discussing. First on the block being Vice from Skies of Arcadia, and also Gilius Thunderhead from Golden Axe. While both of these characters would go on to appear in the sequel as new characters, I think they would have been great additions for the first, especially considering it's been confirmed that Gilius' vehicle was going to be one of the cockatrice enemies from the games, which actually made its original debut in Altered Beast, so it would have celebrated even more of the history of Sega. We know he was even fully playable at some point, so I genuinely don't know why he got the... axe. Get it? Like... like golden... you get it. I've also seen some claims that Nay, one of the party members from Phantasy Star 2, was considered to be in the game, but the cited source on the Sonic Wiki doesn't actually contain any information on this. A different cited source, though, did confirm that they had discussed someone from Panzer Dragoon, though we don't have a specific name. The last three characters are the most interesting of the bunch, though. 
Toe Jam and Earl, from the series of the same name, were in talks to be included, but the talks fell through with Toe Jam and Earl Productions co-lead Greg Johnson. They would have piloted their spaceship as a vehicle. Segata Sanshiro, the man, the myth, the legend himself, was apparently also considered and even had concept art, but never got past the planning stages. Naturally, he would have rode on a giant Sega Saturn. Would you expect anything else? He would later appear in future Sega crossovers, so I wonder what the holdup on him was. Could it just be issues with scheduling by the actor who portrayed him? This one stings the most for me, as I love those commercials, and he's such an entertaining character that I would love to see more acknowledgement for. Last up was a character considered for the Wii version of the game exclusively. Mr. Video Game himself, Mario. The team was in talks with Nintendo, but decided against it as to not cause any confusion in regards to the official crossover series at that point. Which I think is bull, but I digress. Seeing Mario driving a Mario Kart around the worlds of Super Monkey Ball, Jet Set Radio, and House of the Dead would be absolutely wild. Almost too wild to imagine. It's interesting to note that of the realizable IP, all of them made it into the sequel, including even the flagman, Knights. The only new series that had a playable racer in the sequel that we don't know was considered for the original was Shinobi, but if I were to hazard a guess, I'd bet on them being considered as well. But without the 3DS reboot, they couldn't think of a vehicle for Joe. But that's just speculation. And now I've just made myself sad, because I want a third entry in this franchise, and I want it to go back to its roots of just being a Sega crossover. Can we do that? And bring in Soccer Awards, Streets of Rage, and Yakuza next time? Go! Oh look at this game! It has a bunch of characters that I know of! They're all flying around and doing a bunch of crazy attacks! And that's all this game has. Speaking of Sega and Capcom, let's talk real quick about a little series they were involved with. The Project Cross Zone games were a pair of tactical RPGs on the 3DS that were a crossover initially between three notable Japanese gaming companies, the aforementioned Sega and Capcom, but also Namco Bandai. A sequel to the PS2 region-locked exclusive Namco Cross Capcom, these games saw a number of iconic and often underappreciated characters from each company teaming up with some original characters to take down a threat wreaking havoc in all their worlds. Characters from both notable IPs such as Street Fighter, Mega Man, Tekken, Yakuza, Virtual Fighter, and Tails, as well as characters from more niche IP like Soccer Wars, Summon Knight, and Cyberbots would appear and team up in pairs or be summoned as a solo unit to aid in the fight at hand would all appear in the game. Heck, even in the second game, even Nintendo itself would license out some of their characters as well, those that fit the aesthetic and vibe of the game. Specifically, Fiora from Xenoblade Chronicles, and Krom and Lucina from Fire Emblem Awakening. One of the bigger series that played a substantial role in the plot was Devil May Cry, a series initially envisioned by the creative and infamously block-happy Hideki Kamiya, though he would have little to no involvement in the series as it went on. When approached asking why his other beloved brainchild, Bayonetta, did not appear in the game despite being a notable Sega character who would easily fit the game's tone, Kamiya would go on to state that he had been approached but would not sign off on use of the character, citing that he wanted Dante and Bayonetta to meet on his terms, and that he later regretted that decision, considering that while the two of them have technically appeared in a game together, the two have never interacted before and at this point they may never have the ability to. As a fan of both series, and especially Bayonetta, I've always been disappointed that the two of them have never had a chance to officially interact. If you know anything about these two characters, you know that they steal the show anytime they're on screen. Not to mention hearing characters like Kazuma Kiryu and Phoenix Wright, and yes, even the GOAT, Segata Sanchiro, would be icing on the cake. The games themselves may not be anything special on their own, but they're worth at least playing or at least watching a playthrough of just for the interactions between these casts of characters. But I can't help but think that we got the short end of the stick knowing that we were this close to Kamiya's two greatest protagonists being able to argue about whether a strawberry sundae or a simple lollipop is the ideal dessert. This is a bucket. Dear God. There's more. No. It contains a bucket. Dear God. Alright, 
Let's get away from crossovers for a little bit. One of the games that I've definitely sunk a lot of time into is Team Fortress 2. I'd love to sink more time into it, if only Valve gave a damn about permanently fixing the bot crisis. That said, there's nothing wrong with taking a look at some weapon concepts that didn't actually make it in. First up on the block, we've got the Scout. In the release version of the game, the Scout is a high mobility offensive class that has an extremely high skill ceiling, as well as a glass cannon. Despite his speed and oppressive damage output, he's tied with Sniper, Spy, and Engineer for the lowest health total, and only has minimal defensive measures to avoid or mitigate damage like the other three do. The Backpack was a secondary item for Scout that didn't have any combat abilities, but could pick up and store items from around the map, specifically health and ammo and then have the ability to toss them onto the ground or directly at his teammates. While it definitely doesn't fit into the class's general playstyle, I actually think this would be a pretty great addition to the game. A scout should move in, get a lay of the land, and get out, noting anything that will help give their team an advantage. Ultimately, this ended up getting replaced by the Bonk Atomic Punch, a more self-serving item that is really only used to get past sentry guns or make a quick getaway so I actually think the original item would have been the better call. Next up, we have the Sniper. Most of his scrap weapons just change the properties of his headshot, movement speed, or scope, but one sticks out to me, the Boomerang. Very little, if anything, is known about this weapon other than that it was a melee weapon. Knowing TF2's sense of humor, I can speculate that either it would do exactly what you expect, thrown and then return to you if you miss, or drop to the ground if you hit something, or alternatively, it would be right in line with the series' humor to just be a normal melee weapon and not have Sniper throw it at all. Regardless of which way they would implement it, I do think it would be very amusing to have it actually added to the game. Engineer's most impressive unused weapon is the Handy Partner, and it actually didn't replace any of his standard weapon slots, but rather his construction PDA. The only difference we know is that, similar to the Gunslinger's ability to create mini sentries, this PDA would change your dispensers into mini dispensers that would build much faster and cost less metal, but also dispense health, ammo, and metal at a slower rate. I think this would be an absolutely amazing addition, to give Engineer even more customizability with his nest. It doesn't change anything fundamental about the class, other than give them more uptime and make it less devastating to lose your nest. So I say add it. Last up, I gotta go all out for my main, the Spy. Spy is the trickiest class in the game to use, and all of his unused tools create a distinctly different playstyle from the normal class. The Tranquilizer Gun was intended to be Spy's original primary weapon, and would reduce the speed and mouse sensitivity of any player hit by the weapon on hit. This is one of the very few cases where I think the cut was the right call here. Even as a spy main, I imagine this would be incredibly frustrating and unfun to play against. Plus, it would presumably be incredibly weak, with two of spy's most important attributes, getting away and building destruction. The revolver is an indispensable tool for both of these, and the trank gun would make spy much weaker in a fight than he needs to be. Next up, the Dynamite Sapper would have had a much different effect than the Spy's default Sapper. Rather than slowly draining the health of the building until it blows up, it would be on a timer before exploding the building and dealing splash damage to any enemies nearby. I would absolutely love to see this make a return. It's delightfully devilish. Quite possibly my favorite concept of the bunch is the Face Stab Knife, an inversion on Spy's normal MO. This would score insta-kill critical hits on enemies when you stab them from the front as opposed to from behind. Would it be a good weapon? No! Walking directly towards an enemy player is the best way to get yourself shotgunned in the face as a spy. But it would be hilarious for the occasional cheeky kill when your disguise is broken, or if you want to play gun spy and bait people into approaching you. Lastly, there's the Inside Jab, my favorite name of all, which, while we don't know the actual stats of, is speculated to be a knife that would not kill your opponent, but rather plant a bomb inside of them, which you could then remotely detonate, killing them and dealing splash damage to anyone nearby. Because I'm just that kind of person, I absolutely want this in the game, because it would lead to some very funny plays, though I imagine it would be rather frustrating for some players. Of course, Spy in general is pretty divisive, so I say embrace the chaos and give me the funny bomb knife. Say some gangster is dissing your fly girl. You just give him one of these.
Speaking of sneaky rogues with knives, let's pivot over to Persona 5 for a minute. There's not a terribly large amount of interesting information, but there are some juicy tidbits. For example, there was supposed to be another member of the Phantom Thieves that was supposed to be a strategist. This is despite the fact that Makoto in the game functions as a similar role, and while we don't know much about her, we do know that the strategist nature would go on to be a part of Makoto's personality, and the design would later be repurposed into the confidant Hifumi Togo. She was described by the team as a traditional Japanese beauty, and it's highly likely that this would have functioned into her Phantom Thief attire and persona. There's even a rather popular piece of fan art that was being passed around a few years back as concept art, though it is just fan art. It looks incredibly cool, and it could provide us a glimpse at what this character could have looked like. That said, Yusuke already exists to fulfill the extremely Japanese design aspects, and at least two of the better traditional Japanese women in folklore were already used as personas for Yukiko and Chie in Persona 4, so it's possible, but not confirmed, that these could have led to that design needing to be repurposed. While I would have loved to see the design of this unnamed playable character, I think Hifumi in her current state is one of the more interesting confidants in the game. Makoto already fills this niche so having a second one would feel unneeded, and Haru just doesn't have the screen time to go around, so I'm alright with the way that things turned out. What I'm not alright with is the fact that there was originally intended to be an extra palace in the game. While there's nothing remaining of the actual layout or design of the palace in the game's code, we do know who the palace ruler would have been, and it was going to be everyone's favorite pancake lover, Goro Akechi. Texts left over in the game files refer to unused shadow dialogue, mentioning Lord Akechi. The data was left over in the royal version of the game, and has even been modded back in. We even know that one of the enemies within the palace would have been one of the Frost line of personas, Considering Jack-O-Lantern and Jack Frost are used in earlier palaces, it's highly likely that the one that would have appeared in Akechi's palace would have either been King Frost, who appears in Shido's palace in the actual game, or possibly Black Frost, who otherwise is only usable as a persona or fought as a Mementos boss. Based on the code, we also know that the palace would have taken place between Sai's and Shido's palaces, and thanks to the power of modders, we know that the ambiance in the palace would have appeared as if extremely foggy. As for what this says about Akechi himself, considering he would have joined us previously for Sai's palace and fallen for the trick in the game, it's entirely possible that the fog is related to Akechi's beliefs on whether or not the Phantom Thieves truly are just. But what could the theme of the locale have been? Most of the palaces in the game are based on locales a thief might attempt to steal from. A museum, a bank, a pharaoh's tomb, a luxury cruiser, a casino. I couldn't really think of anything like that that would represent a catchy well, but I'd love to hear what you might think. But alas, it seems we may never quite know what truly goes on inside the mad lad's mind. Aqua got Norded! What? Aqua got Norded! That's not words, that's sounds. You're just making sounds. Aqua got Norded! That sounds vaguely inappropriate. I want her to step on me! That is definitely inappropriate. Aqua got Norded! <laughs> okay. While we're talking about scrapped levels, I think that's a perfect segue into the most interesting scrapped content of the Kingdom Hearts series. And who boy, there are a lot. We'll tackle it game by game, then we'll go over some miscellaneous things. In the original Kingdom Hearts, we know of two worlds that were considered, but ultimately would never end up being used in the series. The Jungle Book was considered early on, but was replaced by Tarzan later, as two jungle-based worlds would be overkill. Don't tell Birth by Sleep about Disney worlds with similar vibes, it's kind of sensitive about that. I'm a little conflicted on this one. On the one hand, Tarzan is one of my personal favorite Disney films of all time, and it can no longer be acknowledged as part of the canon in subsequent games, which just feels really awkward. On the other, most of the Disney worlds in the first game were from 90s films. Aladdin, Tarzan, Little Mermaid, Nightmare Before Christmas, Hercules. Meanwhile, the classic era of films is only represented by Alice in Wonderland, Pinocchio, and Peter Pan, so maybe putting another classic era film would have been more interesting. Clayton's notably not a part of Maleficent's villain team, so it wouldn't have required much rewriting. 
I imagine that with the more simplistic tools and moveset design of the Kingdom Hearts 1 party members, this would have been a world without a temporary ally, which, if they had kept to the plot of Donald and Goofy being lost for a while, could have been very interesting to just have Sora wandering alone and scared at the start. If we ever get a remake of the original game, I'd hedge my bets on Jungle Book replacing Deep Jungle. And hey, look at that! I have a whole video about games that need remakes that I think you'd really dig. Sorry for the awkward transition, but while I'm here, I'd like to ask that if you're liking what you're seeing today, leaving a like and subscribing really does help us out, as does leaving a comment. I hate to ask, but it directly does support the creation of future content. And since you're here anyway, I've got some other great videos about Overwatch, Spongebob, Multiverses, and of course, Kingdom Hearts as well that you may be interested in. With that out of the way, let's get back to KH1. Another fascinating world proposition was Toy Story, which eventually would join the series in Kingdom Hearts 3 16 years later with an original location and story. What's especially wild about this is that this was prior to Disney's full acquisition of Pixar, meaning it would have been another party to negotiate with, similar to how they needed to negotiate with the estate of Edgar Rice Burroughs for Tarzan. We only have a single piece of concept art for this, but it tells us a bit about potential areas we could have explored. The little planetoid clearly shows Andy's house and Al's toy barn, and what I believe are parts of Pizza Planet, meaning it could have been based on either film's plot, though the second film I imagine would have fit better with the tone of the game and into the timeline, especially considering these were the days before four party members could be on screen at once, so you'd likely either go without a party member here, or you'd travel alone with Buzz to rescue Woody. I suppose there's always the possibility they could have done an original plot, as that was very prevalent with worlds in the first game, but with the locales being so prominent on the world's concept art, I have to assume this would have been one of the few to pretty closely follow the plot of the film, which would have been fine, though not as interesting. As much as I would have liked to see the scenario play out in KH1, I feel like waiting until KH3, where we could emulate and in some cases even surpass the graphics of the original films, was the right call. And Galaxy Toys does fulfill a similar niche to Al's Toy Barn, so at least there's that. Though I'll admit, I still would have really liked to visit Pizza Planet and have some fun minigames like Avoiding the Claw. Surprisingly, we don't know about any of the unused worlds for Kingdom Hearts 2, but we do know that in days they were planning to revisit Pinocchio with a proper world this time, and it would have featured the characters Honest John and Gideon from the film. The plot would have revolved around the parallels of Pinocchio, a puppet with a heart, and the fact that nobodies have no heart, and this was supposed to be very sad for Shion and Roxas, looking for hope for themselves. The overall concept of the world itself, the Circus of Pleasure Island, would later go on to be realized as Sora's half of Prankster's Paradise in Dream Drop Distance, but without Honest John and Gideon, and with a very different plot. As much as I liked Prankster's Paradise, this is one case I think they should have gone with an original plan. It would have fit more thematically with Roxas and Shion's story, and Days only had returning worlds. A new one would have broken up some monotony, especially considering that the pool of worlds in that game is pretty small. And hey, maybe if they would have done this, then Ruler of the Sky, the worst boss I think I've ever fought in a video game, may not have made the cut. Birth by Sleep was going to feature one brand new world that ended up scrapped. It was based on The Jungle Book, which got axed for a second time, though this time was much closer to completion, as areas of the world can be accessed now through modding, including a cliffside overlooking the human village, King Louis's throne room, and a river with lots of giant pink water lilies acting as platforms. We don't know why this one was so low priority, though some people think that it's due to Neverland containing some jungle-esque areas. Though if that's truly the case, why not axe either Dwarf Woodlands or Castle of Dreams? I realize those films were iconic classics, but including those not only creates a plot hole, but there are three Disney princess worlds with forests and castles in the game, and you really only need one. Of the three, Enchanted Dominion has the most plot relevance, so I feel like Birth by Sleep's world potential was a little bit wasted. Rumors have stated that a Sword in the Stone world was also planned, but as far as I know, there's never been any evidence to substantiate this, so I can't in good faith call it scrapped content. It would be interesting to pick for a future game, though, though I think that Merlin's current role in the plot is pretty, pardon the pun, set in stone. Dream Drop Distance world selection has always been rather strange to me. I think a decent chunk of the world selected are good choices, but the two we missed out on are the most disappointing especially considering Country of the Musketeers made it over them. 
Kingdom Hearts worlds tend to have a prefix before them in the files. For example, Hollow Bastion has the prefix HB, and Twilight Town has TT. And the two scrapped worlds have the following prefixes, JB and TP. For the first one, it's incredibly likely that it's our old friend, always the bridesmaid and never the bride, The Jungle Book. At this point, I think that Nomura's just trolling us. Just watch, in 10 years, we're gonna find a near-finished world in KH Force files, with finished music and a fully moddable Baloo as a party member. The second one is the real juicy one, though. 11 rooms for this world exist in the game's files, 10 of which load the same placeholder area, but the 11th opens to a large, untextured pirate ship. Combined with the TP prefix, and it's pretty clear that this was meant to be Treasure Planet, by far the biggest missed opportunity to include such a dark horse pick, and would have been an absolute joy to explore. Definitely one that I want to see in the future, but only if there's a skiff minigame alongside it. In addition to these, Sora and Riku were supposed to visit different versions of the same worlds for Tron and Fantasia. Sora was supposed to revisit the original Space Paranoids world, while Riku alone would have visited the grid, and Sora would have stuck with the OG Fantasia, while Riku would have visited Fantasia 2000. I'm not really too torn up over losing these, as Sora got his moment to reunite with Tron in the game anyway, and Symphony of Sorcery is already completely different for both Sora and Riku, and is my favorite world in the game as is, though it would have been very interesting to see an area based on the Rhapsody in Blue segment of Fantasia 2000. That's it for cut worlds, but there's a few random pieces of information that I thought were interesting, so let's run over those too. According to Greg Wiseman, one of the creators and producers of the Disney series Gargoyles, a world based on that series was proposed to be included at some point in the series, likely very early on. This would have been huge, and changed the potential world options entirely for future games, as nothing from Disney Channel or the Disney Afternoon Blocks has ever appeared outside of Scrooge McDuck, who was already a pre-existing character at the time. Had Gargoyles gotten in, could Gravity Falls be a potential choice in the future? Would we have gotten a summon of Jake Long? The possibilities could have been endless. I imagine, similar to the long-defunct fan game Kingdom Hearts Inverted Hearts, that the Avalon arc of the story would have been the natural place to set the world should it have gotten in, though a world based on New York itself absolutely could work as well. Though with the series long dead, I don't see a world where we ever see Gargoyles show up, unfortunately. Bahamut, the infamous Dragon King from Final Fantasy, was intended to be a summon in the original Kingdom Hearts. Dummy data still exists for it, but attempting to summon it crashes the game. If I were to hazard a guess, he may have been scrapped for either being too large that he would block portions of the screen, or because a second dragon would seem unnecessary with Mushu on the summon roster. Alternatively, maybe Mushu replaced him entirely because he was small enough to not be distracting. While cool, I definitely feel like Bahamut would have been out of place with the more goofy, cartoony tone of the first game and its character designs. Lastly, a beloved Final Fantasy character was originally supposed to run the Mirage Arena in Birth by Sleep, and it was even supposed to have a tie-in to the game's plot. Laguna Loire, from Final Fantasy VIII, was supposed to run the arena, and as with all Final Fantasy characters in the series, likely would have received a redesign of some kind. Unfortunately, at the same time, Square Enix was already developing Dissidia Duodecim, and for some reason they gave the arbitrary reason that he shouldn't appear in both, and they wanted him more in the latter, so he got axed along with any plot relevance the Mirage Arena would have had. A huge missed opportunity, as the character is super cool, and the Mirage Arena just feels out of place without characters to run it. What's the point of a tournament arc without a storyline around it? If you think I'm gonna spend more than five minutes on this dumpster, then you're crazy! My main book test in this place is disgusting! Let's switch from the Disney Channel over to Nickelodeon, shall we? For anyone not in the know, I love this network and a hefty chunk of its iconic cartoons. SpongeBob SquarePants, Jimmy Neutron, El Tigre, Hey Arnold, Danny Phantom, Teenage Robot, Invader Zim, and of course, Avatar. Also being a massive Smash fan, I naturally was super interested when Nick decided to throw its hat into the platform fighter ring. The first game was a solid foundation, but the second is where it really went from good to great and became something special. But like Smash before it, we have a healthy look into the developers' heads in what kinds of characters they would have been interested in including. 
There's dozens of unused announcer calls in both games for characters not on the roster, ranging from characters I'd love to see, to plenty of mimetic picks, to characters most would consider no-brainers. Interestingly, only two of the 11 characters who didn't return for the sequel actually have announcer calls in the second game, being the other two Ninja Turtles. As for the others, I won't play them all, just some of the more interesting ones for me specifically, but I'll leave a link in the description to a full playlist of the unused cast. Asami Sato, Barnacle Boy, Baxter Stockman, Bubble Bass, Carl Weezer, Dib Membrane, Donnie Thornberry, Jack Fenton, Katara, King Boomy, Man Ray, Mermaid Man, Really, Really Big Man, Sheen Estevez, Skulker, Sokka, Grandpa Steely Phil, Suki, The Box Ghost, a few things I noted while listening to this. Three series in the game don't have any additional characters. Angry Beavers, My Life as a Teenage Robot, and Ren and Stimpy. It seems they've deemed these series as complete with one rep each, though I will note that Ren does have an announcer call separate from Stimpy, and Stimpy does not have one. Dag and Norb also don't have this distinction, however it's possible this was just a carryover from the first game, as the same was true there. Also of note, a number of characters are included that could reasonably function as clones of other characters. Doodle Bob, La Tigresa, Lucille Loud, Nermal, Patrick Notstar, Squilliam Fancyson, Tack, Tenzin. Could we have potentially gotten some of these clones given a few extra months of development, or could some of them have potentially become alternate costumes with different voices? I doubt it, personally, knowing that they could have been following Nintendo's protocol of placing deliberately fake characters while having the announcer record lines, but I do think it's notable there are a decent chunk of potential clones. It's also equally possible they could have been considered as alternate skins at some point, or at least a few of them could have. Patrick Notstar, La Tigresa, and Lucille. Nermal's smaller than Garfield, Doodle Bob would need to be lightweight, Tack is taller than Zim, and Tenzin would have had to utilize only airbending techniques, presumably functioning closer to the first game's take on Aang. But I would like to see some of these show up at some point, should we ever get to the point of having clones in a sizable cast, say around the 45 plus character mark. Doodle Bob and Tenzin, at the very minimum, even have potential to be different from SpongeBob and Aang, whereas the others are definitely supposed to be clones or echoes. Maybe throw in Danny's cousin Danielle from the third season of Danny Phantom, as well as a young Link homage. Outside of characters, I would be remiss not to mention two other hilarious pieces of axed content, one of which involves this statue, which would have most likely been part of Squidward's downcharged Ariel, though I imagine this was axed over ratings concerns. The other piece is a scrapped costume for Garfield, based on a now iconic comic strip in which Garfield disguises himself as a fifth Ninja Turtle, Garfello, in order to trick the others into leaving so he could steal their pizza. The texture of the costume remains unused in the game's files on his texture image file. I think that, unironically, this may be the piece of content I am most disappointed about in the whole video thus far. Let's take another quick detour into a smaller, singular piece of content from a game I know many of you are likely very familiar with, Undertale. There's not much I'm personally super interested in, but there is one enemy in particular that never made it in that I think would have elevated this already great game to even higher highs, the LARPY. This cut enemy, unironically, I think may have been a precursor or inspiration for Birdly in Deltarune. 
A cross between a harpy and a larper, Toby Fox explained that he would have shown up in Hotland and would have had a very interesting gimmick. He would narrate every action in-game like it was an RPG, and that in order to defeat him, you would need to complete a miniature RPG within his battle, presumably like a text-based adventure. It gives me the same vibe as Corgi Quest 7 in A Hat in Time, a joke taken just far enough to remain funny. Whether he would have been a regular enemy or boss is unknown, but I'm pretty bummed this guy didn't make it in, even if he would have been rather obnoxious on a pacifist run if he ended up as a regular enemy. I hope this concept gets revisited for Deltarune as a joke. Maybe have Birdly run a tabletop RPG campaign and do this same kind of dramatic bullshit. Hey boss, a uh, giant floating pizza's appeared and said it's uh, gonna destroy everything that you love and hold dear. Gus, I am filming a commercial and you are going on about a goddamn talking pizza. I'm gonna slap the shit out of you. <laughs> and while we're on the topic of indie darlings, let's talk some Pizza Tower. There's an unfinished level still sitting in the game's code that can be modded back in, and it was one of the earlier levels of the game, intended to be the boss level of the first floor. Simply named Dragon's Lair, this level is a hodgepodge of level parts you would have experienced during the previous levels, though interestingly it does also include the weenie mount that isn't used until Fast Food Saloon on the second floor. Over the course of the level, you would have also dealt with the Cheese Dragon, who would block your progress and attack in a similar manner to the original Bowser fight on the NES Super Mario Bros. by shooting a small fireball towards the left of the screen. In its current state, it would be impossible to P-rank the level, even if second lap were enabled, due to how the weenie mount functions. All in all, I think I am happier without this level, as it's definitely not as meticulously crafted as the rest of the normal game's stages, and fighting the cheese dragon seems kinda unfun. However, given a little bit of polish, and a little more time in the oven, it might have made for a pretty fun level. Though if each boss stage would also have to follow its lead of being also a platforming stage, I think it would have pushed the game back even further, so I think the team made the right call here. We do know of a second cut level known only as The Mansion was also intended for the game as well, and one of the secret rooms in the tower hub contains what would have presumably been part of the stage's background art. We know that there were intended to be a chase sequence by Peppermint halfway through the level, this would later evolve into being Fake Peppino instead, which would further move on to being the conclusion of his boss fight in the final game. In addition, the invincible Pepper Grandpa enemy, who cameos in the Pig City, would have actually ended up being a normal enemy here, and only would have been killable using the Knight or Ghost transformations. In the final game, almost every transformation is locked to being used in only a single level, so it's interesting that seemingly there would have been levels that not only contain multiple transformations, but that they could also show up anywhere. Personally, I think that I like each level maintaining their own transformation. It helps each one stand out on their own, so I do think scrapping the mansion was the right call, especially since in comparison to other levels, the theming for this one feels a little more generic. Outside of levels, there's some unused sprites and even models in the game as well. In the final game, Peppino's taunt animations contain numerous references to anime, some iconic internet memes, and of course, to Wario himself. But there were three that did up entirely scrapped, all three of which I think are very funny, specifically containing references to Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic Adventures box art, and the iconic stock Peter Griffin pose, the latter of which is probably the one I miss the most. I don't really see why these last three got cut, as the game itself already prides itself on being very mimetic, and as far as we can tell, Mick Pig, the creator and main dev, hasn't ever explained why these got removed. In addition to these cut sprites, the level Don't Make a Sound, which is an homage to the Five Nights at Freddy's series, originally had 3D models as opposed to sprites when getting jump scared by the toppin' monsters that chase you through the level, shown here. Apparently, these were cut for taking up too much space. Personally, I would have really liked to see them in the full release, as they would have provided a visual clash that would absolutely fit with the game's sense of humor. Before we get to our final game, let me address a pretty notable omission. Initially, I had planned on talking about the cut content of the Super Smash Bros. series in the video, but I realized that there's so much I'd want to talk about that more than half the video would be taken up by just Smash. So instead, I'll be leaving that to its own video in the future, as well as my take on what it could have looked like. I promise you, it'll be worth the wait. But for now, let's move on to the last game of the video, and it's a doozy, the massive world of Baldur's Gate 3.
Baby's hungry again. I just fed you! Seriously, what is gonna happen? Everyone might die? How might? Pretty might. Just give it to him. Damn it, fine. Warning, this section contains spoilers for Baldur's Gate 3. Skip to this timestamp if you'd like to avoid them. I suppose the first place we should start is the Upper City. While areas of it are playable in the game's final act, it was originally intended to be a fully separate region that, presumably, would have been where you dealt with Gortash's storyline later in the game, as well as providing further potential story options for Karlak. We know this, as all of the endings Karlak has in the game, every fate she can have, is noted in the game's files as a fail state ending. While this doesn't mean these outcomes are necessarily bad endings for her character arc, it does denote that she was going to be giving a proper canon ending. Cazador's palace was also most likely intended to be located here, so Astarian's storyline would have likely been dealt with in the Upper City, which makes total sense as Cazador is a pretty well-known individual in the city in his lore. As is in the current game, a lot of storylines converge in the Lower City, so spacing it out would have been a very nice change in my opinion. Another location intended to be explorable was Avernus itself. You do visit a portion of this layer in the Hells during the course of the game, but you are tied to one specific location. This would have been more like the Underdark section of Act 1, being a region proper, and would have been a locale where you could obtain a supply of soul coins, which could then be spent and given to Raphael, who, rather than his current role in the story, would have actually been a merchant offering rare artifacts and items in exchange for the coins. I imagine you would still be able to perform the current actions in this portion of the game as well, just that Raphael would have had a bigger role on top of what he already does. As one of the game's most entertaining characters, I would have loved to see even more of him. Outside of cut areas though, there's also the fact that Minsk was supposed to be encountered much earlier, as early as Act 1 apparently, as some unused dialogue options in which he participates can be found in the code, both at the Tiefling Grove and with some vicious mockery lines directed at him. How quaint. The hamster has a pet. Considering how little screen time the man actually gets in the story, only being able to be found in Act 3, I certainly would have liked to see more of him. Presumably, meeting Minsk so early on would have also changed the criteria for Jahira to join the party, considering the relationship between the two of them. I really would have liked to see this, because Minsk's writing is so much fun, and Matthew Mercer delivers such an amazing performance that we just don't get enough of him through the course of the game. For your sake, if you've not played it, try to recruit him as early into Act 3 as possible. You will not regret it. Speaking of companions, let's talk about Helia. In the current game, there are a total of seven origin characters. Astarian, Gale, Karlak, Lazel, Shadowheart, Will, and the Dark Urge. You can also recruit to your side Halson, Jahira, Minthara, and the aforementioned Minsk. But there was initially going to be another party member who would have also been an origin character, Helia, who would have been a halfling bard who was also a werewolf. She would have been met in Act 1, found in the goblin camp, caged in wolf form with goblin children throwing rocks at her. We don't have much in the way of plot for her storyline, as she was cut pretty early on, but we do have some voice lines referencing her, with a lot being from the hag you fight early on via Vicious Mockery. I've cured many of lycanthropy, Petal, but with that little fella in your head, all bets are off. Won't have any friends after the full moon, girl. You don't scare me, wolf. Considering that I played a halfling bard in my own playthrough, I think Helia would have made a very cool companion, and would likely have ended up in my party very frequently. Alas, what could have been? Last up, we've got some mechanical goodness to talk about. Crafting. Have you ever wondered why you get so many gemstones and ingots, but that all they're there are for trade fodder? Well, wonder no more, because the early access builds contained crafting benches, but the mechanic wasn't ready just yet. And never would be, sadly. It's likely you would have been able to create or enchant your own gear rather than rely on what you find in chests. While I've always been kind of iffy on crafting in games, this is one case where I would have loved to see it because it would have allowed even more customizability in what I wanted each member of my party to be able to do. You can craft some weapons in Act 1 through some very specific methodology, but unfortunately there's not really anything beyond that. Similarly to having all these materials but nothing to spend them on, I thought it was a really weird decision that there were basically no consequences to amping up the illithid skill tree. 
This is a decision that should have taken a lot to evaluate the potential risks of, and instead I was chomping down tadpoles like Jelly Belly Jelly Beans. Because there was nothing about doing so that caused harm to me or my companions, all it did was help. And for being brain-burrowing parasites, I think there absolutely should have been something bad for each one you down, be it vulnerability to psychic damage until a long rest the first time you eat one, a harder time saving against mental saving throws, or physical changes making NPCs react to you in a different manner. There should be something to stop you from continuing to go down that path, to warn you, or perhaps invite you to keep going should you want to pursue becoming a full illithid by the end of the story. But regardless, just something beyond the surprisingly disturbing animation of the worms digging their way and corrupting your character's brain. That said, Baldur's Gate 3 still ended up being a technical marvel, so I don't want to disparage it too hard, but as a rare case of me wanting more out of an RPG, I think that just these few additions could have added another 20 to 30 hours onto my playtime, and may have even changed the ending I would have gotten, inspiring another playthrough. Not that I have the time for that. But what do you think? Would you have liked to seen any of this see the light of day, or do you prefer the versions of the games we actually ended up getting? Is there any cut content you've also found to be fascinating, be it in one of these games or another of your favorites? Would you be interested in seeing a follow-up all about Smash's fascinating cut content? Let's talk about them in the comments below. And if you liked what you saw today, I'd very much appreciate it if you'd drop a like, a sub, and hit that bell so you never miss an upload from me, and perhaps follow me on Twitter, at IncarnateNerd. And if you'd like to directly support the channel, and only if you can afford to do so, my channel has been approved for YouTube memberships, where you can get some fun perks like having your name featured at the end of the video. With all that said, my name's been Gigi, the Nerd Incarnate, and I'd love to hear from you and I hope to see you in the next video. I hope you have an incredible day. Peace out.